Chapter 88, Schools and Schoolmasters. The previous chapter gave account of an immense body or herd of sperm whales, and there was also then given the probable cause inducing those vast aggregations. Now, though such great bodies are at times encountered, yet, as must have been seen even at the present day, small detached bands are occasionally observed, embracing from 20 to 50 individuals each. Such bands are known as schools. They generally are of two sorts, those composed almost entirely of females, and those mustering none but young vigorous males, or bulls, as they are familiarly designated. In cavalier attendance upon the school of females, you invariably see a male of full-grown magnitude, but not old, who upon any alarm evinces his gallantry by falling in the rear and covering the flight of his ladies. In truth, this gentleman is a luxurious ottoman, swimming about over the watery world, surroundingly accompanied by all the solaces and endearments of the harem. The contrast between this ottoman and his concubines is striking, because while he is always of the largest leviathanic proportions, the ladies, even at full growth, are not more than one-third of the bulk of an average-sized male. They are comparatively delicate indeed, I dare say not to exceed half a dozen yards around the waist. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that upon the whole they are hereditarily entitled to en bon point. It is very curious to watch this harem and its lord in their indolent ramblings. Like fashionables, they are forever on the mood in leisurely search of variety. You meet them on the line in time for the full flower of the equatorial feeding season, having just returned perhaps from spending the summer in the northern seas, and so cheating summer of all unpleasant weariness and warmth. By the time they have lounged up and down the promenade of the equator a while, they start for the oriental waters in anticipation of the cool season there, and so evade the other excessive temperature of the year. When serenely advancing on one of these journeys, if any strange, suspicious sights are seen, my lord Whale keeps a wary eye on his interesting family. Should any unwarrantably pert young leviathan coming that way presume to draw confidentially close to one of the ladies, with what prodigious fury the Basha assails him and chases him away. High times indeed, if unprincipled young rakes like him are to be permitted to invade the sanctity of domestic bliss. Though do what the Basha will, he cannot keep the most notorious Lothario out of his bed. For alas, all fish bed in common. As ashore, the ladies often cause the most terrible duels among their rival admirers, just so with the whales, who sometimes come close to deadly battle and all for love. They fence with their long lower jaws, sometimes locking them together, and so striving for the supremacy like elks that warringly interweave their antlers. Not a few are captured having the deep scars of these encounters, furrowed heads, broken teeth, scalloped fins, and in some instances, wrenched and dislocated mouths. But supposing the invader of domestic bliss to betake himself away at the first rush of the harem's lord, then it is very diverting to watch that lord. Gently he insinuates his vast bulk among them again and revels there a while, still in tantalizing vicinity to young Lothario, like pious Solomon devoutly worshipping among his thousand concubines. Granting other whales to be in sight, the fishermen will seldom give chase to one of these grand turks. For these Grand Turks are too lavish of their strength, and hence their unctuousness is small. As for the sons and daughters they beget, why those sons and daughters must take care of themselves, at least with only the maternal help. For like certain other omnivorous, roving lovers that might be named, my Lord Whale has no taste for the nursery, however much for the bower, and so, being a great traveller, he leaves his anonymous babies all over the world, every baby an exotic. In good time, nevertheless, as the ardor of youth declines, as years and dumps increase, as reflection lends to solemn pause, in short, as a general lassitude overtakes the sated Turk, then a love of ease and virtue supplants the love for maidens. Our Ottoman enters upon the impotent, repentant, monitory stage of life, forswears, disbands the harem, and grown to an exemplary sulky old age, goes about all alone among the meridians and parallels, saying his prayers and warning each young leviathan from his amorous errors. Now as the harem of Wales is called by the fishermen a school, so is the lord and master of that school, technically known as the schoolmaster. It is therefore not in strict character, however admirably satirical, that after going to school himself, he should then go abroad, inculcating not what he learned there, but the folly of it. His title, schoolmaster, would very naturally seem derived from the name bestowed upon the harem itself. But some have surmised that the man who first thus entitled this sort of Ottoman whale 
must have read the memoirs of Vidocq and informed himself of what sort of country schoolmaster that famous Frenchman was in his younger days, and what was the nature of those occult lessons he inculcated into some of his pupils. The same secludedness and isolation to which the schoolmaster whale betakes himself in his advancing years is true of all aged sperm whales. Almost universally, a lone whale, as a solitary leviathan is called, proves an ancient one. Like venerable, moss-bearded Daniel Boone, he will have no one near him but nature herself, and her he takes to wife in the wilderness of water, and the best of wives she is, though she keeps so many moody secrets. The schools composing none but young and vigorous males, previously mentioned, offer a strong contrast to the harem schools. For while those female whales are characteristically timid, the young males, or forty-barrel bulls as they call them, are by far the most pugnacious of all leviathans, and proverbially the most dangerous to encounter, excepting those wondrous gray-headed grizzled whales sometimes met, and these will fight you like grim fiends exasperated by a penal gout. The forty-barrel bull schools are larger than the harem schools. Like a mob of young collegians, they are full of fight, fun, and wickedness, tumbling around the world at such a reckless, rollicking rate that no prudent underwriter would insure them any more than he would a riotous lad at Yale or Harvard. They soon relinquish this turbulence, though, and when about three-fourths grown, break up and separately go about in quest of settlements, that is, harems. Another point of difference between the male and female schools is still more characteristic of the sexes. Say you strike a forty-barrel bull, poor devil, all his comrades quit him but strike a member of the harem school, and her companions swim around her with every token of concern, sometimes lingering so near her and so long as themselves to fall a prey. End of chapter 88